again. This is uh, the Timberwolves and Lynx Amphitheater, and uh, this is where they do all their learning sessions. And it's a great facility. I think you're going to really enjoy the rehab uh, and uh, research area as well. So, so basically, we've been studying ACL and ACL prevention for about 25 years. And what we're going to talk about today are several aspects of both primary and secondary ACL prevention. And the way we have this set up is basically in four parts. The first part is primary prevention that we're going to do this afternoon. And the first half of that, the first section is primary prevention from a didactic standpoint. And then the second is from a hands-on workshop. Uh, standpoint. Then tomorrow we're going to get into secondary ACL prevention and the same setup. We're going to start out with didactics and then we're going to go into into actual uh, hands-on workshop approaches. So over the last 25 years how have we got involved in this? Well I, I'd like to go back in the start. I think it's instructive I started out in Cincinnati uh, with a group called Cincinnati Sports Medicine and I directed research there. Now we had, we covered a lot of schools and a lot of facilities and one was called Soccer World which was north of the city in Mason, Ohio. And Mason had, uh, had a facility which was kind of ideal to do ACL research because they had six indoor soccer fields and six outdoor soccer fields. The indoor soccer fields were turf, the old kind of turf, the Astrid turf, you know, that slick plastic turf, and then outside was grass. And one of the first studies that I did with that team was we wanted to look at the surgeons were sure that more ACL injuries were occurring on Astrid turf than were occurring on grass. So the nice setup that we had is that in injury epidemiology, it's rather easy to get the denominator, relatively easy, not always, but relatively easy to get, I should say, the numerator, the number of injuries that occur, how many injuries are occurring. That's relatively straightforward. But the denominator is the tough part. How much exposure does the athlete actually have? So we ended up in kind of a, a perfect situation because what, what, what they had was rec soccer leagues. These were all 20-somethings. And what they, what they did in these rec soccer leagues is you had to have an equal number of, of men and women. So what we had was a, a game was an hour long. So we, and each player played the whole game for an hour. So we had really good exposure numbers. We knew they played one hour, everybody played, and we could track those athletes over time. Now, what we did was when we conducted this study, we looked at the data and basically showed no statistically significant differences between males and females. I mean, I'm sorry, between, between astrid turf and grass, there was no difference. But then when we looked at the data more carefully, what we showed was that there was actually a significant di difference. Females were 6.2 times more likely to tear their ACL. And that led to 25 years of work that I'm going to talk about next. So that's sort of the history of how we got started in this. And what I'm going to start in with is just because you're going to hear a fair amount of biomechanics here. So I'm going to give you a short, relatively short, 15-minute introduction to biomechanics. And this is a volleyball player, obviously. This is uh, an open sim model of a, a volleyball player doing a volleyball spike. So biomechanics. I love biomechanics. I think you guys will see the team here. This is, uh, it's really cool stuff because basically you're turning uh, live living things into math and physics. And that way you can measure outcomes with a high degree of, of quantification and validity. And this goes all the way. We're going to talk about Sir Isaac Newton and his famous theories and all the way to, to Tiger Woods. I find the Tiger Woods story intriguing, right? Sports specialization. Remember 10 years ago and everyone said, you got to sport specialize because then you're going to turn out just like Tiger Woods. And now they say, 
you better not sports specialize because then you're going to turn out just like Tiger Woods. So it's an interesting uh, turn of events. And, the, and that's a whole nother lecture in itself on sports specialization. There's a lot coming out on that. So what we, we use biomechanics in sports, looking at both performance and injury, uh, sports injury, especially sports injury prevention. But we also do applications. Actually, my man Nate here, I stole him away from NASA about 10 years ago. And there's lots of applications in areas like ergonomics, product design. And we do some of that at Mayo as well, down in Rochester. If, if those of you don't know, the first FDA approved total hip implants were developed in the biomechanics lab at Mayo and actually implanted in, in patients at Mayo 45 plus years ago. These same types of tools that you're going to see in the lab are exactly the, the camera system we have. The first system we bought down at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, we had to wait about almost a year to get because Hollywood was buying up the cameras so fast. So all that, when you see Gollum is a production of the same exact camera system that you're going to see out in the lab today, but they look at kinematics, how people move and, and develop these movements, you know, with various skins they put on these animators. Obviously, Gollum is a real person. And so even with Walt Disney, very, there's, there's no drawing anymore. Everything is animation, and much of it is done through mocap, motion capture analysis of people running around doing various movements, and then they put skins on top of them. Again, same camera system, but we had force plates. So applications in physical medicine, orthopedics, prosthetics, and kinematics is, is movement. So simple enough, description of movement, and kinetics. If you have forces, as we're going to show you out in the lab, you can get kinetics, which is the forces associated with movement and acting on the body. And then we can also get measures of neuromuscular function if we use tools like, say, EMG to look at muscle function and control of movement. So what does biomechanics deal with? It deals with all of these things, forces, levers, energies, torques. And we're going to talk a lot about torques. We're going to talk a lot about center of mass because center of mass determines the direction of torques. So what makes things move? Simple enough, force. In the absence of force, no movement can occur. So what is force? It's just this way I used to do all my training days. I would have either a push or a pull. Either you pull it toward you or push it away from you. So which causes or tends to cause motion? So forces are necessary for motion to occur and are also the result of motion. So what do we need to do to increase force? What do we need to decrease force? Well, forces on the body, where do they come from? The musculature in the body generates the forces. Where do the forces acting on the body come from? Things like weights, uh, either the ground acting on the body. So what determines force? How do we measure force? It's the mass, the amount of matter, times the acceleration or the change in velocity. And so to manipulate a force, we either have to change the mass or we need to change the acceleration. The cool thing is force is a vector, and we're going to show you this in the lab as well. It not only has a magnitude, it has a three-dimensional direction. So here's an example of a magnitude of 30 newtons in a direction of 45 degrees. The other great thing in biomechanics is we can add these vectors together to come up with a resulting vector. So it then gives a total sum force. And when force called rotations, we call them torques. And we're going to talk a lot about torques, and that's why we need this primer. But basically, any time a force is acting around a joint center that is rotating, you have a torque. And how do torques and forces differ? Force is mass times acceleration. Torque is force times distance. And the distance is between the force and the axis of rotation of the joint. So some examples. A force of 10 newton meters acting two meters away from the joint center is a 20 newton meter torque. So what does this mean to us? Well, for example, in studies we showed over 21 and a half newton meters of valgus torque, of dynamic valgus torque, push the, the uh, knee into a position where the patella comes into contact with the lateral femoral condyle in this valgus position, and that predisposes people to patellofemoral pain, for example. So 21 and a half Newton meters is, is sort of a cutoff. So these have real uh, 
dependent uh, applications in the body. 30 newton meters of torque, 30 newton meter, 10 newton meters at 90 degrees, three meters away from the center mass. So for example, for ACL injury risk, and we're gonna show you a lot of this data, 25.25 newton meters of valgus torque, that dynamis, dynamic valgus torque, puts you at increased risk of having an ACL, ACL injury, so. And then again, 45, 10 newton meters at 45 degrees at a distance of three newton meters, 21 newton meters of torque. And that brings us back to that valgus torque of 21 newton meters that predisposes you to patellofemoral pain. And we can also do this in the upper extremity at the elbow. Straight construct, you put a weight, and from there you can calculate the amount of torque around the elbow joint. Center mass and the rotation around the center mass is really important and we're going to talk about this a lot in the course. And basically the center mass is the center of gravity. Well, what is the center of gravity? It's that point at which all the mass uh, comes together, the, the equal point of mass distribution. So this is important for balance, for sport, functional activities, sporting activities, and injuries. It's a big problem in the elderly, control of the center of mass over the foot base. So the definition, the point around which the mass of the body is equally distributed is the center of mass or the center of gravity. So factors that influence this are the amount of mass somebody has. So for example, athletes that you work with, the larger the athlete, the more mass they have, the more risk they have because they're hitting the ground and the ground is hitting them back with the same amount of force. Those forces are higher, they're at greater risk. The location of mass, the position of the body segments and adding external mass. Anytime you add a ball, even a ball or a racket are gonna change. That's gonna change the position of the center of mass. So the relationship to balance then factors and influence balance, the base of support, the height of the center of mass, and the amount of mass. So here's an example. When people say, you got two seconds to tell me how to prevent an ACL injury in an athlete, I'm going to give you the punchline of the whole course right here. Teach someone to control their center of mass over the plantar surface of the foot base with the knee and the hip in a stable neutral configuration. If you can do that repeatedly in high level activities, you're going to reduce their risk of an ACL injury. So the center of mass is crucial. So let's quickly go through Newton's three laws. So the first law of, of momentum, an object will remain at rest unless acted upon by an outside force and an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So why is this important? Force is required to change the state of an object's motion. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion and the amount of motion of a moving mass has is due to its inertia. Due to its inertia is the object's momentum. So what is momentum? The quantity of motion that something possesses. It's the mass times the velocity is momentum. So the human body possesses momentum. So for example, when I'm simply walking across this floor, I have momentum. I, my body segments have inertia. I'm hitting the ground and the ground is hitting me back with somewhere between two and three times my mass. So as I've been telling you, I've been studying this guy for 25 years. That's a, your ACL. It's proportional to the size of your pinky. Your PCL is proportional to the size of your thumb. And they cross one another. That's why they're called the cruciate ligaments. They create a cross. And where they cross is the center of the hinge of the knee joint in the sagittal plane. And that center actually changes as you flex and extend the knee joint. And so that has important implications. This ACL is, this has a very high modulus of elasticity. What does that mean? It means it's very strong and very elastic. So as I said, I'm hitting the ground and the ground is hitting me back with two to three times my body weight just as I'm walking across the floor. Believe it or not, that's enough force to tear my ACL. Now how much, AC, how much force can an ACL uh, resist? And Nates are going to show you this in, in some of our talks, but basically if you pull the joint apart like this in a cadaveric setup, and we're going to show you some of these, it takes about 1,800 to 2,200 newtons of force to tear an ACL apart. If you convert that, it's around 200 to 250 kilos of force that's required. So 
walking across this floor, I'm around 100, 105 kilos. The ground is hitting me back with somewhere between, say, 210 and 320 kilos. That's enough force to tear my ACL. Now, again, this is a highly elastic. So what I'm telling you is I could hang this ACL off the ceiling and I could hang two of myself and hold on and that thing would hold together. It's very strong. But the ground is hitting me back in excess of two times my body weight. And if you compress the joint because of the concave, uh, convex to convex surfaces on the lateral joint, what you get is in deep compression, hard compression, you get this. You know how you tear the ACL? This combination, distal tibial, A, this is my fibula, distal tibial abduction combined with anterior translation of the lateral compartment, internal rotation, pop if applied rapidly. Now luckily, we know how to develop and, and recruit neuromuscular control. Muscles are designed, muscles and nerves, to work together to recruit muscles in a way to absorb and dissipate those forces so that usually the ACL sees very, very little force. So we need to look at the inputs of momentum. For example, to create momentum of a golf ball, you have to apply momentum from the club. So we expend energy to change the momentum of an external object. And uh, momentum can be transferred, just like the Twins, uh, at the Twins game, a pitcher transfers momentum to that external object, to the ball, or during running within the body from one segment to another. So angular momentum, is the law of conservation of angular momentum. Objects will remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. And angular momentum, again, depends on mass, angular momentum, and the moment of inertia. So angular momentum, again, mass, angular velocity, and moment of inertia. And for angular momentum to remain constant, if a moment of inertia decreases, then angular momentum velocity must decrease. So let's go through Newton's second law. So it's the law of acceleration of force. When force is applied to an object, the acceleration of that object experiences will be proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the object's mass. So why is this important to us? Large forces are needed to produce high rates of acceleration and objects are large require substantial forces to cause them to move and accelerate in motion. So Newton's third law, this is really important one. We're gonna talk a lot about this in the lab. This basically is the basis for inverse dynamics of how we measure forces and torques on the body. So it's the law of equal and opposite action and reaction. For every force that is produced, a second force of equal and opposite magnitude and direction are also produced. So the important points, forces result in reaction forces that act on the body and moments of one part of the, movements of one part of the body produce counter movements in another part of the body. So in every action, as I was just saying, if I hit the ground, the ground is hitting me back with an equal and opposite force. Now, because we have force plates, we can measure that. And from there, we can look at the distances to joint centers and we can calculate torques. And we will show you how we do that in the laboratory. So for, again, for every force applied to the body uh, of an object, the object applies an equal and opposite force. Again, that, that tennis racket is applying a force back to that athlete's body. That's why over time, an, an athlete's bones, a tennis player's, uh, if they're a right-handed tennis player, their bone enlarges by Wolf's Law. So any movement by the body when it is free in space results in counter movement. That means it's impossible to initiate rotation, for example, when the body's in air, when there's no force to push against. So prevention of secondary uh, ACL injuries. So what we're, uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna get into primary first, secondary tomorrow. So what we use, and Nate and I wrote this paper up, we just published this in AJSM a few months ago, and basically this idea of preventive biomechanics. And we do use this for musculoskeletal purposes that we're gonna be talking about today, ACL injury, cartilage issues, but we also look at systemic exercise issues like obesity, activity, sport specialization. We look at neuro neurological problems. April McPherson, who one of our graduate students is doing concussion studies, and she has some really interesting data we just and we have a meta-analysis that was just accepted into AJSM that shows if you have a concussion, your risk 
in the following season of having a, a follow-up lower extremity injury are two and a two to two and a half times higher than someone who hasn't had a concussion. Really interesting data that that April's found. And so we also look at, I started actually as a cardiovascular biophysicist. I, I, I worked in, in animal models and that's how I really got into biophysics and biomechanics. And we still do some of this work in cardiomyopathy, which is the number one killer of young athletes. And then with genetic aspects, and I'll talk about some of this tomorrow as well, some of the genetic studies we're doing re related to ACL injury and to cardiomyopathy. And then what we do is we get the entire medical team involved. That's the, the physical therapists, the athletic trainers, the physicians, both the PM&R physicians, the surgeons. We get everyone in the process, the scientists all working together. And what we do is we do this system where we screen, surveil, intervene, follow up athletes. So basically there's kind of four different areas that we, we utilize. We look at mechanisms, how injuries occur, and then we take that mechanistic information and use that to screen athletes to try to risk stratify, figure out who's at relatively high risk, who's at relatively low risk. Then based on the, the mechanisms and the screening, we develop targeted interventions that reduce the relative risk of injury. And we're gonna talk a lot about that in the next couple days. And then we do outcomes and we do follow up and we see can we actually change relative risk paradigms. And we do this in, in very targeted populations, needy populations, adolescents who are at high risk, minority populations, female populations that are underserved, and the whole medical team. And basically, one of the reasons we moved here to Mayo is because it's taken 25 plus years, but it, we've made it happen where basically our clinical protocol is the same as our research paradigm. They're totally intertwined. Every patient is a research subject. And it's, it's really amazing and, and the team and I are really grateful to be here. So basically, I think everyone's probably seen this video a thousand times, but it is somewhat instructive. So basically what you see is a perturbation to her center of mass. And what happens is the center of mass, what the ground reaction force, as she hits the ground, the ground reaction force is tracking her center of mass. As her center of mass moves lateral to her knee joint, you have a torque, a force of a ma which is a high magnitude because she's landing flat footed. It goes lateral to the hip and knee and it's a valgus or external abduction torque. It's abducting the distal tibia. It's collapsing the hip and the knee in. So basically what we've done is we've used this as a model. And if you, if you look at this, again, this four-pronged research approach, we look at mechanisms, screening and risk stratification, training, and then we look at uh, effective outcomes over time. So to get at, as I just said earlier, to get at to prevent this from happening, first thing we have to do is look at very carefully at the mechanism. How does this occur? Well, if you look at the body, the lower extremities in this valgus knee abducted position, the knee starts out relatively straight. There's low flexion. Most, if not all, the, the force and weight is on a single flat rotated foot. Usually the foot looks either internal or externally rotated and the center of mass is displaced away from the foot base. That's again why I keep saying center of mass over the base of the foot with the hip and the knee in a stable configuration. Now, if you translate that whole body habitus injury uh, uh, mechanism into just the joint, if you focus down and you look at just the joint, here's what's happening. Again, the fibula, distal tibia, abduction, anterior translation, internal rotation, and together if rapidly uh, applied without proper muscular recruitment, ACL ruptures. Very different athlete. This is Michael Owen tearing. This is a second ACL tear. He's tearing his ACL. And what you see is when we started out 25 years ago, we hypothesized that the male and female mechanisms would be different. They're not. They're, they're pretty much the same. And what you see is the movement of that center. So his foot hits, it's flat footed, that means a high force. It goes lateral to his hip and knee collapsing, that's that dynamic valgus knee abduction torque. 
Female athletes, as I said, are at greater risk. We've been we've been by the NIH and NFL charities for more trying to figure out why and how. Interesting at different and within sport, the difference is relatively consistent. Females in, in basketball, for instance, are about four to six times more likely to tear their ACL, whatever level it is. And if you look at whatever level of soccer, it's somewhere between about two, or football, it's about two and four times, two to four times higher in females relative to males. So again, focus on the injury mechanism to develop your interventions. And then what we did over the last 25 years or so is we looked at a lot of data, a lot of data out of our lab, a lot of data out of other people's lab, and we tried to synthesize this into a useful construct. And basically what we did is we came up with these four neuromuscular imbalances that directly relate to these four aspects of the injury mechanism. This knee abduction aspect we, we're going to call lig a ligament dominance neuromuscular imbalance. This low flexion aspect we're going to call quadriceps dominance. So we'll talk a lot more through the course about what, what we mean by this. Single leg, leg dominance, and the foot away from the center of mass decreased trunk stability. A punch line right here. So again, I'm going to try to hit this punch line as many. You can use our system, you can use anyone else's system, but they have to have these common components to them to work, to be valid. And so the knee abduction, you need, need biomechanics and technique. This low flexion, a lot of power training, you have to increase relative ham quad re recruitment. And most of this we do with plyometrics. Rapid, high force exercises that recruit the posterior chain, make the athlete less ligament dominant. They don't la allow that force going to the joint and the ligament, but they use especially that posterior chain muscle to absorb those forces. We do a lot of single leg work because the injuries happen on a single foot, single leg. We teach the athlete to roll the foot because a flat, fixed foot is where uh, is the position of tearing of the ACL. And the foot away from the, 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 uh, center, the center of mass away from the foot base, we do a lot of core training, but it's very foot-based core training that's going to transfer onto the field and onto the court. So ligament dominance, again, just to explain this a little further, is the inability to control this medial lateral knee motion. Very often you'll see these athletes, and we'll show you videos. The, the Shea Ralph video is, is a great one where she tore her th third ACL. It's a jolting action. It's the acceleration of the acceleration of the joint, very rapidly back and forth varus valgus. And then it's increased ground reaction force in coronal plane moments. Quadriceps dominance, you hear people say, I've actually heard surgeons say, that's the problem, is these women's quads are too strong. That's ridiculous, utterly ridiculous, of course. It's that they're not recruiting their posterior chain sufficiently. Don't weaken the quad, strengthen its antagonist. And so, and that's under recruitment of the knee flexors and, and the glutes. So leg dominance, side to side imbalances and muscle strength and coordination. Great athletes actually create symmetry over time. They, they actually, to be really great at their skill, some of the best athletes are some of the most asymmetric athletes. What we have to do is create greater symmetry in the presence of that great skill. And then trunk dominance. And trunk dominance, when we first reported this back in the, around 2000, uh, about five years later, someone, we said it's because the trunk's too upright. Someone said, no, the trunk's too flexed. And then we figured it out. It's just too much trunk range of motion. The trunk's moving around too much in the center mass that the ground reaction force is moving around too much. And that's when you get these jolting, you know, varus valgus type torques at the hip and knee. So looking at this mechanism and look at screening. So look at him. He uses his knees like hinges on stiff muscular springs, absorbing those forces and torques, where she uses her knee joints like her hip joints, like ball and socket joints on loose springs. So we're not screening for him. We're screening for her because we want to pick out that athlete and then target training to her neuromuscular imbalances. 
This is what it looks like in the lab that we're going to show you later today. So basically dropping off a box, what we do is set a basketball up at their max height. So we test them repeatedly. They, they have to grab the basketball, so they have to get it to center line. They have to get to the center line of that basketball. It's a vertical, vertical uh, drop vertical, grab the basketball, set at their max height. And basically, I want to point out four things here. Here's basically what she does. If, you, if she drops out the box, she, she drops unevenly. So she, the first thing she does is she points with her dominant right foot, which leads to an extended right limb. See her pointing. She, we ask her to drop equally with both feet. She points with a dominant right limb, which leads to a flat foot, high ground reaction force landing, which is asymmetric side to side, high force, high distance to the joint center, high dynamic valgus torque, collapsing her hip and knee. And the Nates are going to show you in, in the talk after the next one about how we use many different kinds of experimental paradigms. So what we do is we take entire teams, they come in on the bus, we have stations set up. For example, we did this for the whole five years we were at Ohio State, the incoming freshman football team. We've done it for an entire county school systems, uh, girls playing volleyball basketball, soccer, those high-risk sports. And what we do is we take that 3D in vivo data that we're going to show you how to collect later in the lab. Raina Hale is going to show us in the lab how we do this. And then we feed that into cadaveric models. And that's what the Nates are going to show you in their talk coming up. But then we also have, we take that data and feed it into cadaveric no, uh, models. and and. Nava, who is with our group, uh, is expert in this area. But basically what we do is we take that and then we throw all those data points up against the wall to see where they intersect and where all the answers come out the same in all these different experimental paradigms. We know that to be the valid mechanisms and the valid screening tools. So this is an example of a bone bruise where what happens when you, when you get this kind of a movement, that kind of alignment with compression of that ground reaction force, what you end up getting is a pattern in athletes that basically is a forensic validation of how you tear your ACL. It happens on the posterior lateral tibial plateau, the bone bruise, with the anterior lateral femoral condyle. So that's, that's because that anterior translation and internal rotation with abduction, that's the bone bruising pattern you get. So what we've done is we've fed that into computer models. This is one example. And uh, what we showed was this is the bone bruising pattern I talked about, posterior lateral tibial, anterior lateral femoral condyle. And when you put that into a computer model, what you see is when you combine these three rotations, you get five times the force. Now you can anterior shear alone, abduction alone, internal rotation alone, increase strain on the ACL significantly, but not enough to tear the ACL. However, and the Nates are going to show you this, when you combine this together, there's enough force to validly, reliably, repeatedly tear the ACL. This is the this is the pivot shift exam. So what's the surgeon doing or the clinician examiner doing on this uh, pivot shift exam? Again, this is a forensic analysis. What he's doing is reproducing the rotations and translations that occurred during injury. So how do you, this is the number one most specific clinical test for an ACL tear. If you have a positive pivot shift test, you have an insufficient ruptured ACL. So what are they doing? They apply knee abduction, internal translation, and anterior translation, and anterior internal rotation and anterior translation. Just what I'm showing you. Overwhelming evidence that this is the mechanism. So again, looking at all those data points, throwing them up against the wall and seeing what the, where the vitro, the cadaveric data show it, young cadaveric data, which is important. These aren't, the work that we do is with, in, with people uh, close to 40 years old. Valgus occurs simultaneously with other loads. The computer models demonstrate it. The in vivo data demonstrates it. On some, 
this this is still believe it or not this is still uh, controversial some people say the only way you tear your ACL is through a massive quad contraction that pulls your tibia forward relative to the femur don't need ground reaction force whatsoever it's wrong that idea is wrong sports forces happen in three dimensions this doesn't just anterior translation of the tibia is not what tears an ACL in an ACL rupture on the on the court so basically it is a mechanism of combined translations and rotations for risk screening this is Rondo tearing his ACL what you see is this combination of single leg landing on a valgus extended knee and again as I talked about what we do is we use these coupled biomechanical epidemiologic studies this is a team that we showed the validity at University of Kentucky at Cincinnati and Ohio State we tested them at all the labs and published several papers showing the validity of our approach again watch him pop his ACL it's flat foot high force extended knee dynamic valgus collapse of the hip and knee so again, we need to look at these parallel neuromuscular imbalances and then take advantage of that. And what we're going to get into next in, in the second part of this is looking at the problem post ACL reconstruction. In that, and this is Kate's data, so our, our keynote speaker who's up next, who comes from us, La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia, is the expert in return to sport, the expert in, in the psychological aspects of returning to sport and post ACL injury. So basically, what she showed that people were saying, oh, the surgeons would tell us 98% of these people are going back. 98% of my people are happy and they're going back to sport. Kate showed in longitudinal studies that no, that's not the case. Basically, at one year, only two thirds are returning or at one year only 50% are returning, at two years only two thirds are returning. And then, consilience of data sets is very important. Disparate data sets from all over the world coming together. Basically, we published at the same time, and this, it was a, Mark Paterno was a, a PhD student of mine, and in his thesis, we followed kids up and we showed if you were young, physically active, going to the, back to the same level of sport, in one year your risk of a second tear was 25%, in two years it was a third. Now when we first published that, that I, I was worried because those are really high numbers and people were saying, well in Cincinnati and Columbus you guys must not know how to reconstruct and rehab ACLs. But then from the whole other side of the planet, Kate and Julian Feller and their group showed the exact same numbers which really validated what we were doing. So I'm going to turn the floor over to our keynote speaker next, Dr. Kate Webster, and she's going to talk to us on the psychological aspects of sport and re return to sport and the psychological aspects post-ACL injury. Dr. Webster, welcome. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Does she need both? I'm happy to take questions while we uh, do the tech support here. All that biomechanics completely and crystal clear. Well, we're, we have plenty. We have plenty of time together to in the next yeah, couple days to just clarify just anything that isn't. Any questions at all? It is. Anyone want to tap dance? I always enjoy listening to Kate. Please take it away. This one's a little bit different though, and in my talk I want to tell, refer to now why the mind does matter in the terms of ACL, injury, rehab and return to sport. So I just want to talk you through a scenario first quickly. So this is you and you're taking a moment to reflect. Because I hate to tell you, but a year ago today, you injured your anterior cruciate ligament. It was a beautiful day, just like today, and you went out to play your usual sport. Perhaps it was a seemingly simple pivot to change direction, or you landed awkwardly from a, a jump. No matter what the mechanism, you were devastated. You're otherwise young and healthy and just didn't expect this. 
your sport is important to you, so you decided to have reconstruction surgery. And good news, the surgery went really well. Rehab was hard and tedious, and you've also really missed playing your sport, particularly the routine and the friendship from your teammates. But a couple of months now ago, you went and visited the surgeon and everyone's really happy with your knee and you've been fully cleared to return to sport. But you haven't gone back yet. You've given me some really good excuses why not. You know, work's been really busy. It's uh, halfway through the season, so maybe it makes sense to wait to the start of the new season. But deep down, you're still really aware of your knee and quite anxious about things. So here you are now. It's perhaps the start of the new season. You might be sitting on the bench waiting to go on, or you might be part of a pep talk listening to your coach, or right at the start of the, the new ski run at the start of the next season. So how are you feeling right now? Hopefully you're um, happy and excited to be there, but quite uh, obviously you're probably a bit anxious, nervous and fearful as well. Are you confident? Are you actually worried that you won't perform well and let everyone on the team down? Whether or not you were um, reflecting on your own personal experience here or that of an athlete that you've treated, it's quite clear that there is a psychological component to ACL injury and recovery. And I'm going to talk about some of my research in this area today. So, if we look at psychology and sport injury as an area of research, there's a whole host amount of research that looks at psychological factors that predict injury. And this is largely based on injury stress models that include personality, life stresses and coping resources. But this is not what I'm going to talk about today. Instead, we're going to look at psychological factors associated with recovery from sport injury. And again, there's a vast and growing amount of research in this area. But interestingly, most of this research looks at injuries that really only keeps the athlete out of sport for maybe a couple of weeks, which is quite unlike ACL injury, which as we know has a long rehab period and therefore some of the psychological responses are perhaps heightened from this. So, looking at the psychological impact of athletic injury, we know that athletes can have mood disturbances such as anger and depression when they're injured and feelings of decreased self-worth. They also have negative emotions, which include shock and frustration. And all of this threatens the athlete's um, athletic identity. And I really like this quote because I think it sums up a lot of the issues we deal with. So, from an emotional or psychological standpoint, serious injury is one of the most traumatic things that can happen to an athlete. It can take away an athlete's career at any time. It threatens the feelings of invincibility and immortality that anybody who is young has to some degree. I think that is really reflective on some of our younger athletes. Because athletes are so dependent on their physical skills and because their identities are so wrapped up in what they do, injury can be tremendously threatening to their self-identity. It's also important to recognise that the psychological response to injury can continue long after the injury has occurred. And this has an impact on both rehabilitation and return to sport outcomes. Return to sport can be affected both by psychological, physical and social or contextual factors. So biopsychosocial models have been used to try to conceptualise the interplay between all these factors. In such models, psychological uh, factors have both a direct and indirect and mediating um, impact on both physical, social and contextual and functional performance and then ultimately on return to sport. Injury characteristics and socio-demographic factors have an indirect um, influence on their, uh, which are both mediated by psychological, physical and social or contextual factors. If we now turn and look at psychological aspects related to recovery from anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, there are a couple of areas that do have some merit and literature, which include conditions and emotions, as well as the athlete's behaviour and self-efficacy and locus of control. 
If we first of all look at psychological um, emotions and cognitions, interestingly and quite fittingly, the first substantial research in this area actually came from Mayo Clinic. It was uh, quite some time ago where um, Michael Murray and colleagues had 27 athletes, uh, both recreational and competitive, and they got them to fill out this scale which is called the Emotional Response of Athletes to Injury Questionnaire, which I've got here in the slide. And basically you just give each of these emotions a number with the highest meaning you've got the highest you know a greater level of mood disturbance and what they found was that for the competitive athletes which is shown in the top trace which has a circle around it once they were cleared to return to sport which is the level five there there was an elevated mood disturbance so they described this as an emotional u pattern and what was really important and the take home message from this study, which hadn't really been factored into until this time, was the whole um, difficulty with athletes who had ACL reconstruction in making that transition back to sport. Everything up until this time had focused on the injury in itself and the rehab, but this really highlighted that athletes don't necessarily make that smooth transition back to sport and they have some really negative psychological emotions associated with it. If we look at the athlete's behaviour, there's a fair bit of research that looks at how athletes use very, various coping strategies, such as goal setting and seeking social support, and on the effect that this has on their adherence to rehabilitation. Uh, it, research shows that personal factors such as pain tolerance, positive self-esteem, etc., have a positive effect on whether or not the athlete adheres to rehab, whereas things like fear of injury and mood disturbances has a negative effect. And um, it's quite well known that obviously athletes who better adhere to their rehab tend to have better um, clinical outcomes. Uh, other psychological factors related to recovery include self-efficacy. So this is the belief that you have the ability to succeed in a particular situation. And there's a fair bit of research from, um, it from Scandinavian countries showing that higher levels are related to post-operative physical activity as well as returning to sport. Locus of control is another concept that's often used in this area, which is the belief that there's a relationship between one's actions and outcomes. So basically how control of the situation are you feeling? And research here shows that those athletes who have a high internal self-locus uh, self of control, so they feel in control, tend to have better subjective and knee functional outcomes. And there is some research that shows that a high internal locus of control is related to whether or not the athlete returns to sport. I just want to quickly mention also that as well as psychological aspects of the whole recovery from ACL rehabilitation, there's some psychosocial aspects that we need to keep in mind too, particularly the patient practitioner relationship. And this has really been shown to have a crucial impact on the patient's experience of rehab. And there are many ways that a practitioner can facilitate the rehabilitation process. Some positive behaviours that a, a rehab um, practitioner can explore uh, display include um, building a strong alliance with the patient or athlete, being genuine and empathetic and also having good communication, which kind of goes without, without saying. But also what interestingly, another factor that's been shown to make an impact is whether the practitioner makes it clear to the athlete what their whole role in the rehabilitation process is. So they need to tell the athlete that the athlete has to have some levels of self-motivation. They have to be compliant. And more importantly, it's up to the athlete to communicate their concerns back to the practitioner. And if athletes uh, are informed of this, it seems to have a much better um, impact on the whole rehabilitation process. Uh, social support is also really important for the athlete during rehabilitation and this can come from coach, teammates and family. And I've put these pictures up to show you that not always, there's a lot of positive aspects of social support but not everything can always be positive. I certainly would like the first coach rather than the second coach um, instructing me. 
All right, now let's talk about the psychological factors that influence returning to sport following ACI rehabilitation, reconstruction. And one of the ones that's most commonly talked about, obviously, is fear of re-injury. And this is one of the most common reasons cited by athletes who don't return to sport or cite restricting their sporting activities. But what constitutes fear is actually a bit unclear. Is it fear of pain of the injury itself? Is it that the athlete's worried about having time again off work, therefore being re-injured again? Or fear of not actually being able to perform in the same way as they did before their, their knee injury? Uh, as some recent qualitative research has also shown us that athletes are worried about long surgery, uh, sorry, long recovery and having restricted function, and there are some personality traits and social um, priorities that come into play here as well. We often hear from our athletes, no, my wife won't let me go back to play. Uh, but just to, this is something that I sort of as a pet thing of mine, is fear actually, the, we use the term fear of re-injury and I'm guilty of it myself, but is it really the correct terminology? Should we really be saying re-injury anxiety, which describes the emotional response of the athlete rather than fear being a biological mechanism and stimulus specific response? Uh, the second psychological concept that's talked the most about in returning to sport after ACL reconstruction is psychological readiness. There are a number of definitions for this, but it's certainly there is some consensus in the literature that it's influenced both by an athlete's emotions and confidence. And that confidence can be their belief in the rehab process or whether they feel that their injury is in fact truly healed. And as I mentioned, whether they believe that they're able to perform at the same level. There's a number of measures of psychological readiness which I've listed here. The first lot are, are not injury specific, but the final one, the anterior cruciate ligament return to sport after injury scale, is one that we developed a while ago, which is an ACL specific measure, and I just want to talk to you a bit about that. Um, people often ask me what how did this come about and at the outset it wasn't something that I was like yes I need to go and develop a scale but um, I was part of a study that we were looking at a randomised control trial comparing hamstring and patella tendon grafts and I was following a group of athletes who I got to know really well over many years we saw them at two weeks four weeks eight months six months one year two year and there were a couple of athletes that really stuck out in my mind when I saw them at two years, one particular um, young guy who was a fantastic soccer player, all the outcome measures that we normally do were fantastic. I'm like, oh, so tell me about your soccer. How, how are you enjoying playing that? And he just went to me, oh, no, Kate, I haven't gone back yet. I went, oh, why not? And he just pointed to his head. So I knew that there was something more that I had to do in this area. And I looked at the literature, and I've given a bit of a, a brief of this already, but there were three specific aspects of psychological responses in terms of returning to injury that the literature was jumping out at me. And that's, as I mentioned, the athlete's emotional response, their confidence in their ability to perform, and they, how they appraise the risk of returning to sport. And these were the things I was interested in, but there was no existing scale at the time that really was asking the questions, tapping at these concepts um, that I wanted to measure. So hence the development of our, of our scale. Um, the emotional response part has five items, which looks at four emotions, with two fear of re-injury items. We, we threw in the concept of accidentally injuring your knee just in, in addition to the athlete being fearful. In terms of confidence, as I've mentioned, I think there are two important aspects of confidence. Both the confidence in that, that the athlete has in their ability to perform well, but also, and equally important, is the confidence that they have in their knee function. So i.e. that it will hold up and won't give way. So we have both of those aspects of confidence in the scale. And there's some examples there. In terms of risk appraisal, initially we just had the one item, whether the athlete thought they were likely to re-injure their knee. We gave the scale to a pilot group of um, about 30 athletes for their comment on the content readability, and we got the suggestion that the thought of having to go through the whole um, surgery and rehab process again would prevent them from participating in their sport. So we added that to the scale. 
we initially gave it to a sample of 220 patients who had ACL reconstruction. They're all sports, but any level of sport. And when you're developing a scale, diversity is, is uh, beneficial between eight and 22 months post-surgery. And what we found was the scale had really good internal consistency and a principal components, components analysis showed us that there was really one factor which accounted for most of their variants. So whilst we constructed the scale around three separate sort of domains, all of them were so interrelated that they um, essentially measure the same thing which we now have termed psychological readiness. In terms of validating the scale, we split up our sample in terms of those that had given up sport, plan to return, training only and full competition and found that those who had given up sport scored significantly lower than those other three categories as had those who had returned to full competition scoring significantly higher with no difference between those that were planning on returning who were a little bit earlier post-surgery and those that had went to training only. We looked to see whether it changed over time and influenced sport in a second study that one of my honours students um, did. And what we found was that the psychological, the, the scores on the scale at six months um, were reflective of whether or not the athlete had returned at 12 months. So for those who hadn't returned, scored significantly lower at six months than those who had. And this is at a time point before the athlete had even tried anything yet. So what this highlighted to us was was that fairly early on in the recovery process, we could pick out those athletes or the scores on the scale, distinguish between those athletes who did and didn't eventually return to sport at 12 months. Did a further longitudinal study where we had a whole range of um, psychological variables that everything pretty much that we could find in the literature that was related to the psychological recovery of ACL reconstruction. Large group of 187 athletes which we assessed before surgery, four months after and then again at 12 months. And what we found was um, uh, three of the psychological factors predicted returning to sport at 12 months. Preoperatively, scores on the ACL RSI led to us looking at fourfold increase in the odds of returning to sport, the athlete's recovery expectation as well as locus of control. But the ACL RSI score was the only measure that actually predicted return to sport at 12 months at both preoperatively and again at four months. We've done a little bit more research now on psychological readiness and we just, um, in our collaboration with uh, the group here at Mayo, we published this just uh, about a month ago now, I think, to look at what psychological factors are associated with um, psychological readiness and find that males, younger age, if you have a shorter time between injury and surgery, if you more frequently participate in sport before your injury, if you perform better at some functional tests and have higher ratings of knee function, these are all factors that inform an athlete's psychological readiness. I'm often asked what do the scores on the scale mean? Remember now that we are actually measuring a latent trait here, so there's gonna be diversity, but this is what I'm always asked. So we've done a little bit of work on this. In our initial work, if you had a score of 56 points and above, that was at four months, that was predictive of your return to sport at 12 months. Just some more recent work that we've done, because we now have actually a short version of the scale, uh, with the full version, a 62 point cutoff for scores at six months, predicting return to sport at 12 months. Understandably, the score gets higher the longer time from surgery because you, you increase over time, or 60 points with the, with the short version which, version, which is now available. I haven't gone into detailing that today, but that's only six items. So if you want something that's really quick screening for your clinic, that's a potentially good tool to use. Um, what about for those who don't return? We've shown that if you have a score of 42 points or less, that's predictive of not returning to sport at 12 months and a little bit less for the short version. Uh, so to summarise, scores above 60 more likely to return by 12 months and below 40 more likely to not have returned. And we don't know as much about the certainty of those that score in between there. And it's also important to note that some athletes still score low and return and there's a lot of reasons why this might be the case, including pressure from outside sources. And some level of fear and anxiety is absolutely normal. But it does allow us to perhaps narrow down the athletes who we want to have further conversations with from a psychological perspective. 
just want to throw in another, um, a few other tools for the clinicians, uh, ones that I think are good but often underutilised. This sports medicine injury checklist is a really interesting one. It was published quite some time ago and its idea is to sort of triage the athlete into those that might need some more psychological counselling. It has a broad range of issues. There's both an acute and chronic phase version of the scale. There's no points for this and the items aren't weighted. It's simply a bit of a checklist for you to get a better understanding of the psychological status of the athlete. Uh, Les Podlock's work is actually really good if you're wanting to better develop an injury intervention plan for the athlete and he lists um, eight skills that the practitioner can work with the athlete through that whole rehabilitation process. And I've just put in the last part of his injury prevention plan there but it's really, if you're interested in this it's really worth looking at. It's a whole other talk again at the whole source of it which um, it, it, the skills about confidence in return to play having mental toughness in the athlete and the athlete being able to incorporate all the lessons that they've learnt through the rehab process to make them a, a better and more ready athlete, uh, prepared athlete overall. There's a whole host of psychological interventions that have been tried following ACL injury and a recent systematic review has just put some of these together. They include, as I mentioned, relaxation, guided imagery, um, goal setting, etc. Uh, they're yet to be specifically targeted though at returning to sport. And whatever intervention that we do, we really need to um, pitch this at a community level and be cost effective and accessible. I'm just going to now leave you with, I'll play this video in a moment, but this has two purposes. First, I'm obviously from Australia and Australian rules football is our um, sport of choice and one of the sports that gives most of our ACL injuries. So I get to introduce you to Australian fo rules football, but Daniel Menzel is a patient of ours and his story I think really encompasses a lot of what I've been talking about today. So let's just see if we can get this. Take a sec to start. This injury happened in our qualifying final, so like the playoffs for you, so really important match.
Sorry, the video is going a bit slow, but he made a successful return and he's actually still currently playing. And it's a really inspirational story. And what Dan's also done is launch a website designed, really recognising that his, as a professional football player, he had much more access to resources than what um, your Weekend Warrior Day does and has a, a website dedicated for young athletes who have had ACL injury to help from a psychological perspective. So thank you. Questions for Dr. Webster while we're switching over to Nate? It's really amazing. So as, uh, as Tim mentioned, um, we do a lot of the lab work behind uh, basically what Tim has presented to you and, uh, and what Kate has presented to you. 
Um, so we're going to science you real hard for the next half hour, but uh, it's not going to be alphabet soup. I think you'll be able to relate to most, if not all, of what we're presenting. Um, it's just in a lab environment instead of uh, inside of your clinic. Um, so one of the best ways to understand the way something happens is to recreate it, right? So this entire presentation is related to the recreation of ACL injuries. Um, we call this an in-sim approach, and by that, what we mean is that we want to take the live factors that are seen in patients and subjects, feed them into in vitro cadaveric models um, of various varieties, and then use the, the information coming out of those cadaveric models to feed a finite element computer modeling. Um, the idea is that all three talk to each other and through the uh, uh, correlations we find in all three models, we can better pinpoint what our mechanisms are, how to treat them, and, uh, and how to make improvements. So um, to start off, we need to understand what's going on in the first place. Um, we're talking about ACL injuries, obviously, here. So we need to know that these mechanisms are mostly non-contact with 70% of them happening without a direct blow of force to the knee. We need to know that um, they're happening within 100 milliseconds of ground contact. Most hypothesize within 50 to 67 milliseconds of ground contact, so they're very fast. Um, and we need to understand the of activities that are leading to these injuries, mostly a rapid change of direction or uh, um, a deceleration, uh, a change in, uh, in the rate of movement. So um, within that, we know during these activities that are leading to ACL rupture, we have uh, various combinations of loading, and those are the combinations that Tim was just talking to you about, the, uh, the anterior tibial shear, the knee abduction moment, and the uh, internal tibial rotation all occurring at that knee joint, all coupling together, increasing the strain on that ligament, and therefore increasing its risk of failure. So we take that knowledge of speed, of positional awareness, and of the changes that are occurring at the knee uh, in these live athletes, and we try to use that to build a contraption that will mimic um, mimic those activities, mimic those motions, and mimic them in a real-time scenario. So my background, um, I did all my graduate work under Dr. Hewitt, and I did it using robotics to reproduce motion in cadaveric limbs. I could pr reproduce that motion we recorded from the uh, in vivo uh, motion system with excellent precision and accuracy. Problem is really slow. Robots are slow. In order to get that kind of precision and accuracy, they need to think about where they're going. I'm not going to produce an injury with a robotics model like that. I can understand intraarticular joint mechanics, no problem. But our objective here is to reproduce an injury. So we built our giant erector set uh, for adults here. And uh, um, what you'll see through this uh, aluminum frame is uh, is we are able to, in fact, produce a ACL injury in a cadaveric limb, and we're being able to advance the science around the field because of that. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, our objectives with designing this machine were clinically relevant injury patterns. Um, so we needed to have something that looked like the OR, and we needed it to consistently look like the OR. If we produce one injury out of 10 specimens, that's a waste of time and money for everyone. Um, so we needed that accuracy, that reproducibility, and that cl clinical uh, mock uh, mock-up of the injury mechanism. Um, and like I said, the idea is to provide additional insights to uh, to where we can go in the future. I'm going to hand over to Nate Shalady now, and he's going to walk you through the uh, the methods we apply to build our simulator. So as uh, Tim had mentioned earlier, it's quite important that we have a valid model. And really what the, the model entails is that we have cadaveric specimens that are more age-specific. We know that a lot of ACL injuries occur 
at that younger time frame of life, teenage years, adolescence, early 20s. So if we're using 80-year-old specimens, it's not really valid to the model. So uh, our inclusion criteria for these specimens is that uh, they are ages 14 to 52, and they are unembalmed, fresh frozen cadaveric lower limbs, once again, to maintain that integrity of the tissues, not to alter anything that, uh, that would then affect the results. And then also that there's an absence of any lower extremity injury in their health record. We don't want to have any type of uh, tissue biomechanics that would throw off what we're trying to record and reproduce. And we would store these limbs at negative 20 C until 24 hours prior to testing in which we would slowly throw them at room temperature and then start the preparation for dissection. So uh, luckily, hopefully your, your lunch is digested by now, but these are the actual specimens that we would test and we would, we would fix them with this tibial fixture that you see uh, on these pictures here to the right. And we would section them at the mid femur just uh, 20 centimeters proximal to the patella, and that would give us hot. If you can look up at that top picture, the resin we put around the femur and that allows us to pot it into a six axis slowed cell so we can actually measure with, with high accuracy the kinetics and kinematics occurring at that point. And then we have quadriceps and hand that are then dissected away, we denude the, the musculature from the tendons, and then we can clamp on muscles so that we can then simulate muscle loads. Because once again, we can't have a floppy leg in a simulator. It needs to be co-contracted so that it's actually reproducing what is happening in the real world environment. So the remaining muscu musculature in the skin is left intact so we can get a realistic load transfer. And then we implant these uh, special devices here, which we have learned to hate because they're annoying, and <laughs> but they're the necessary evil. They're called DVRTs, and they're basically a glorified uh, magnetic uh, ring structure that has a plunger in it. And as this plunger moves in and out, it allows us to measure strain because there's these two prongs on then gap apart as the ligament is straining. So the other Nate is very professional at implanting these and uh, so done a third ligament now with the LCL so we can measure all three of the ligaments simultaneously. And then we place this potted leg, you can see in the middle fixture here, that's the six axis load cell that measures the kinetics. And <clears throat> at this point we stick that femur into that pot and we secure it. And then we attach that tibial fixture that you saw on the previous slide, because that tibial fixture allows us to apply the knee abduction, the anterior shear, and the internal rotation to the tibia. And then we also position the angle of the knee at around 25 degrees, which is a typical position when ACL injury occurs. And then we align the leg so that the uh, the shaft of the tibia is in line with the vertical force that we will be applying. Now there's a couple ways you could approach this. Obviously you want to simulate a ground landing so you could accelerate the leg towards the ground but then you have the whole leg that has to be in motion. So what we do is instead we invert the leg and then we have a sled that will accelerate. We attach the muscles, the external loads, we apply constant muscle loads currently in the model at a one-to-one -one rate and then we prepare for impact. So the uh, impulse force application like, like I mentioned is that drop sled. This is a half body weight drop sled, about 75 pounds, and it is positioned 12 inches above vertical height. So this is to simulate that drop vertical jump that the uh, subjects would be performing uh, in a laboratory force plates and we utilize lead pellet weights. This was a new addition because when we use a solid weight, just like Tim had mentioned the, uh, the Newton's laws of, of physics and motion, when you have a solid weight and you drop it, the first thing it wants to do is bounce right back up. And if you ob observe people falling or dropping to the ground, you notice they don't reverberate too much. Uh, they stick that landing, they hit hard, and 
and that's where all the force goes into the body. So this lead pellet weight actually disperses uh, that rebound laterally and in all directions so we diminish that rebound and once again try to model this injury to the most accurate form as possible. We have these which you saw in the video there and once again the the impact is delivered in line with that tibial shaft. Then we also have some external loads that are applied. We have these automated pneumatic cylinders which will be attached to these cables onto that tibial shaft and as they pull they'll be able to apply those loads, the knee abduction, the an anterior tibial shear, internal tibial, internal tibial rotation, say that three times fast. And uh, this is over a three second data collection. Now these loads are applied very quickly. When we initiate that that data collection, the pneumatics will load that joint and before that first second is up, all of these loads will be on the knee and then that impulse will be applied as if the leg were moving on the ground. Then we had to have a series of tests to actually prove the validity of what's happening here so that we can measure strain at different criteria. So, from the subjects that were tested in vivo landing on force plates, we had 67 of them doing vertical jumps. We were able to parse apart their, their landing structure into low, medium, and high risk in each of these three motions, the knee abduction, the anterior shear, and the internal rotation. So what we did is if we calculate these tertiles, the math comes 46 randomized tests if you were to apply, say, a low load on cam, a low load on anterior shear, and then maybe a high load on internal rotation. So if you try all these combinations, you end up with 40 randomized tests. The top sled remained constant at the 75 pounds, so half body weight. And if a specimen were to survive all 46 of these randomized tests, then we would enter what we would call the failure protocol, which we would apply 100%, which is equivalent to the loads you see here up in the uh, top right table. And at 100%, we would, at each iteration, increase the loads by 20% on each cylinder. So now they're getting very high loading. And we would also move our drop sled to half of the known body weight of the actual specimen. So not just the 75 pounds, so it may get up to 115 if they were a 230 pound indiv individual. So we'd increment until failure. This is overall what the setup will, does look like. So we have the leg inverted. It's inside of a six axis load cell at the femur. And then we have these pneumatics that kind of make a Y around the limb. And those applied the loads to the hamstrings and quadriceps. And then the other pneumatics that you see surrounding and attached to that tibial fixture, those are the pneumatics that would apply the external loads. And then once again, when we trigger our software, which you see here, it's all automated, so it applies the loads and also records all the data and does something like this. So here's an actual impact. And this is an actual rupture trial, so if you observe on the right-hand side, this will replay a few more times. If you watch the anterior tibia right near the joint, you'll actually see it slide forward slightly right after impact. All right, I'm gonna pass it back to the other Nate. All right, so as uh as Nate was explaining, you know, we've incorporated those elements I was talking about earlier. We've added the speed, we've, add, we've added the musculature, we've added the position. All of the things that Dr. Hewitt and Dr. Webster were talking about are built into this model. Um, that's great. We've all seen athletes tear their ACL in the field, so we need to add information to that, not just reproduce it. So what do we pull out of this impactor? Well, as Nate indicated, we have gauges on the ligaments, so we know real time what strain's being produced during these injury events and these pre-injury loadings. Uh, we have the six degree freedom forces, so we know the uh, forces and torques that are occurring inside of the knee joint. 
Um, we also have um, uh, marker triads that we affix to the tibia and the femur, so we know the relative joint positions of the two seg of the two segments. Um, and finally, um, we have uh, we have GoPro video cameras. So yes, we have your 2D video, just like you have a 2D video of someone blowing out their uh, their ACL in the field. And uh, this is kind of what set data looks like. Um, consistency is important because uh, if we're inconsistent then we don't necessarily know what we're actually producing. You can see uh, by our graph overlays here that uh, the behavior uh, between trials is relatively the same but the magnitude's going to change. Well that's exactly what we'd expect to see because we're running the same motion over and over and over again. We're just adding um, different degrees of external loading to it, and that external loading should increase or decrease the magnitudes um, that our specimen is producing inside the joint. Um, as Nate said, we go until failure. Well, how do we know that failures occurred? Um, we don't have eyes that are fast enough to uh, predict immediately a after a rupture without watching it over multiple times that a failure has been initiated. So we need to rely on all these sensors we have running. Um, what I have up here for you is a graph of our strain gauges um, inside of the ligaments. Now understand that these are measures of voltage so it's upside down from what you would expect. The lower the bar goes the more, uh, the more strain our ligament, our specimen was experiencing. In the, uh, in the first set of blocks, you see the ACL and the MCL behaving exactly as we would expect. Kind of have a baseline, a strain from the neutral position of the leg and the, uh, the external loads applied to it. You have a jolt of force as that impulse is delivered, and then a recovery. Well, in the, uh, in the second uh, graph to, the, uh, to your right there, um, you can see that that jolt of force got significantly greater. Well, that was a significantly more violent uh, trial with greater uh, knee abduction, greater internal rotation applied to the joint. And on the third trial, uh, the furthest to the right there, you see our nice little blue sensor? It never comes back. It never came back because we tore through the uh, ACL like tissue paper on that trial. Um, it didn't even try to come back because there was nothing to come back from. So that is, uh, that is how we measure that we've done exactly this to our ligament. Now, I know um, most of our audience are, uh, are trainers and, uh, and physical therapists, but if you've ever been inside the OR and seen a reconstructive surgery, I'm guessing uh, what you saw the surgeon pull out looked pretty much like this because that's exactly what our surgeons tell us. So, like I said, reproducibility is key. If we can't produce these injuries with some sort of consistency, we're going to waste a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, so what did we have uh, come out of our, of our trial? We've tested uh, 40 limbs through our impactor setup uh, at this point in time. Uh, 35 of those limbs presented ACL rupture, so that's an 88% success ratio. So we're checking that box off, no problem. Um, as Tim mentioned, uh, we need specimens that aren't 80 years old. If I put an 80-year-old limb into that impactor, I'm going to shatter its femur in three seconds. Um, that doesn't help us either. So we need younger specimens, and we've been able to achieve that through an anatomical donations program over on the East Coast. We have an average age of 40, uh, mass of uh, 85 kilograms, um, height 173 centimeters. So the point is, we aren't dealing with extremely obese limbs. Uh, we aren't dealing with extremely anorexic uh, specimens. We've got a mid-range. Um, are they a perfect replication of the athletes on the field? No, but they're a lot better than most of the historic uh, biomechanics data from the 80s and the 90s where, yeah, what you got a hold of was the 70, 80 year old person who donated their body to science after they passed away. Um, what we're also seeing in the impactor is right up until that failure point, we're seeing about 15% strain on the, uh, on the ACL. That happens to echo 
the failure, um, the failure percentages that we're seeing uh, from previous biomechanics work. So we've changed the uh, model, we've made it more clinically relevant, but the, uh, the failure percentage is, uh, is in the same ballpark. And also important to note is you'll notice the MCL strain is about a third of what the ACL strain is. Uh, we have additional robotics work that I've alluded to that shows the MCL during a natural motion, during a uh, non-injurious task, is bearing much lower amount of the force going through the knee uh, than the ACL is. And we're seeing that continue to be echoed in these injury uh, in these injury models. Um, now, 40 specimens. Is our, uh, are our ruptures happening specific to one sex or is it happening across the board? And the answer is across the board. Of those 35 that failed, 18 were males, 17 were females. Dr. Hewitt mentioned that the mechanism between males and females um, are the same or very similar, and we're seeing that in the laboratory too. Um, our impulsive force is generating four to five times body weight. Uh, that's exactly what we see in the in vivo lab when we do our motion capture studies, when these athletes are landing from their, uh, from their jumps. As I mentioned, 88% success rate, um, 30 complete ruptures, uh, nine mid-substance, and two tibial eminence failures. I'll come back to that point in a second. Um, we have five partial ruptures and five specimens that were able to uh, uh, survive, at least in their ACL, our testing. Um, it is a large amount of force. It is a cadaveric tissue that doesn't have the capacity to recover. So yeah, we had a couple of femur fractures and we, uh, and we uh, also uh, had a couple of isolated MCL tears um, without an ACL failure. And believe it or not, with all the abuse we showed it, one of these limbs uh, just kept on smiling and was perfectly intact when we pulled it out of the impactor. So to, uh, to visualize what I just said, here's all 40 of our tested specimens. Um, only five of them didn't rupture their ACL. And in terms of distribution of, uh, of where that rupture occurred, the vast majority of them happened either mid-substance, represented by the pink, or uh, in the proximal third, close to the femoral insertion, represented by those in blue, um, which meets up with our clinical presentation of the injury. So we have here is a graph of uh, um, our current impactor being the red bar, a, uh, of the clinical literature um, of where we see it, um, ACL ruptures in clinical patients in, uh, in gray, you'll notice a large similarity between the red bar and the gray bars. They're following the same pattern of femoral side to mid-substance to tibial side ruptures. And finally, we have uh, the little blue bar. Well, this is iteration three of our impactor device. Uh, iteration one is represented by our blue bars. We still had an 87, 88% success in ruptures, but the 60% of those ruptures were tibial eminence uh, fractures and or uh, avulsions of the tibial side. Not the clinical presentation for injury, hence the redesign and, uh, and current uh, manifestation of our device. Well, um, to further illustrate the, uh, the point and the, uh, uh, our degree of being pleased with the location of our ruptures, we have a database that we call the REP database in Rochester. It is a, um, it is a maintenance of records of every operation and procedure and visit that has occurred at Mayo Clinic and Olmstead Medical Center um, canvassing Southwest Minnesota since 1963. Um, so we can mine that data for, uh, for clinical outcomes um, to an extensive amount. Um, but what I want you to take away from this is in that clinical presentation of, uh, of data, we just finished going through data from 2010 to 2016 pertaining to ACL injuries. And the two places all those ACL injuries basically happen at are that femoral side um, avulsion or proximal third of the ACL and or mid-substance. We've created a model 
of clinical rupture uh, in the laboratory. Um, and one, uh, one final point, well, not final point, but one final measure of validity is uh, we all know that MCL ruptures happen with ACL ruptures. They happen in about 30% of the cases. Lo and behold, of those 35 cases where we had ACL rupture, we had um, 10 cases where the MCL concomitantly failed with it, uh, which is 29% uh, concomitant failure. Again, we've matched the clinical uh, presentation, uh, visual um, pictures of, uh, of what we've been able to see, the femoral avulsion, the, uh, the complete mid-substance tear, you can see part of our sensor hanging on. Um, obviously, the other half of the sensor is missing, which is why it never recovers. Um, and, uh, and then finally, um, a partial mid-substance tear where we've definitely damaged the ligament, but uh, you can see my probe is, uh, is still tugging on some tissue that's, uh, that's remaining intact there. So we took one of these specimens up to the arthroscopic lab. Let's have a look at it the same way the surgeons look at it. And sure enough, it looks like that crab meat explosion of an ACL that Dr. Critch, Dr. Dom, Saris, uh, so on and so forth um, are seeing prior to the, their performing of the, uh, of the reconstruction. All right, so uh, I'm gonna throw some numbers at you. Um, like I said, we put these triads to measure the, uh, the positioning and the alignment of the two segments. What did that tell us? Well, we learned that uh, larger external loads uh, increased our internal knee rotation. Makes sense, follows through with the, uh, the literature. Larger external loads also drove greater anterior tibial shift, all right? Also pleased with that, also aligns with the literature. Um, and that anterior tibial shift was largest between zero and 66 milliseconds. That same time frame where we uh, anticipate from video analysis that an ACL rupture is, uh, is happening. So um, to further illustrate the timing, uh, you can see that the, uh, the strain on our ligament, ACL would be the, uh, the red lines and the, uh, the MCL would be the blue lines. Um, it remain, it's fairly constant in flight leading up to the point of initial contact, which is uh, represented by that dashed, uh, that dashed vertical line. Um, and then somewhere between 50 and 100 milliseconds, we reach that peak strain. Now, obviously, these are non-failure trials because a failure trial graph that, uh, that line would go off into space is the, uh, is the ACL ruptures. Um, but the point is, in our non-rupture trials, that peak strain is happening right in that sweet spot of 60 to 70 milliseconds uh, following initial contact. These injuries are happening rapidly happening rapidly, uh, probably more rapidly than your musculature can react after you hit the ground. Um, we, uh, we have three elements we apply to these limbs, the uh, knee abduction, anterior tibial shear, internal tibial rotation. Well, um, in terms of parsing out their individual contributions, if you follow the graph from left to right, the further up and more red the graph gets, the more that element is, that individual element is contributing to the overall uh, strain condition of that knee. You can see that the anterior tibial shear, internal tibial rotation, they're contributing. The graph is going up, but it's a gradual change. You look at that knee abduction graph, and it's all but vertical. I mean, the knee abduction is significant, the significant driver um, to failure uh, in the joint. And to condense that to a couple of bar graphs, um, the steps from left to right in the knee abduction are larger steps than either the anterior tibial shear or the, uh, the internal tibial rotation. All right. Um, uh, Dr. Hewitt and Kate talked about uh, relative injury risk. Well, we like to quantify based on those thresholds what the, uh, the relative injury risk of the athlete is in vivo, right? Does that matter in this model that's matching a clinical presentation? Sure enough, um, baseline risk, low risk, moderate risk subjects, they're fairly consistent. There's not a statistical difference 
um, in terms of the strain generation during these landings. But you enter that, that high risk category, that, that high clinical um, disposition for uh, those athletes who are most likely to experience an ACL tear, and suddenly the strain's gone up, which means their likelihood of injury, both in our model and on the field, is higher, and you do see a, a statistical change there. This is another, um, another graphic to, uh, to express that point um, relative to, uh, to ground contact. Uh, Dr. Hewitt mentioned that some research groups think it's this large quad contraction and that contraction is happening before you hit the ground. Well, if that's the case, then all that strain on the ACL should be being introduced prior to that ground contact. Instead, you see here, in our um, in our left third of the or left quarter of the graph, that uh, um, prior to uh, um, prior to impact, you have strain, but it's to a uh, to a limited to excuse me to a uh, to a limited degree. After you uh, you have impact, um, that strain kicks up to about a four percent change. Um, after, uh, after you make contact with that ground. That ground is delivering a 4% impulsive load. Uh, whether you are a high loader or a low risk loader, or baseline, moderate, doesn't matter. It's 4% coming. Um, so if you've got a baseline subject and they're at between 0 and 1% strain um, at the time that initial contact happens, that 4% is not really going to matter. But you get to these high loaders and these, uh, these pre-failure failure trials where you got 6 7% strain. At the time that initial contact comes, suddenly you're up in the teens when you add that 4 or 5% uh, that comes with impact. And that's right in the sweet spot of where your, uh, your ACL is going to fail you. So one last time, I'm going to switch over to uh, Dr. Shalady. He's going to talk about some of the sex differences we've been noticing in these specimens. So very similar to what Dr. Bates was just stating, uh, we've got the strain measurement. And what was interesting to know is that although it was not statistically significant between males and females, when we looked at absolute maximum ACL strain, females were 3.9% greater in terms of strain compared to, to the males. And if you looked at the maximum ACL strain across all external loading conditions, females still were greater than or equal to 3.2% higher strain than males. So although not statistically significant, we, we have to wonder, is it clinically significant? And that's what the MCID is. And that's something we're going to look into because even though it may not show statistical significance clinically, that, that number may make a big difference. So when we look at a consistent trial, say for example, the 67% uh, knee abduction, anterior shear, and also internal rotation, the MCL experienced 2.4 to 3.6% strain, whereas the ACL experienced 7.7 .7 to 11% strain. And, it, and the larger values were in the females. So this demonstrates that the MCL does bear some load, but it's a lot lower load than what the ACL is, is bearing and that the ACL is a significant rest restraint to these combined loads of knee abduction, anterior shear, and internal tibial rotation. In terms of kinetics, uh, you can see here that there are sex differences with females being more significant than males. Uh, I just have different lateral medial translation, anterior posterior translation, and also some rotations put in here. And the big takeaway here is that there are sex differences, that females are at higher risk for ACL injury. Once again, that is just concurring with what's already uh, stated in the literature. And this is a graphical plot, just so you can see those differences. Once again, look at how females have a lower minimum and a higher maximum. They're having a larger range of motion of strain. And also at that peak point of strain, around 66 milliseconds, they're significantly higher than males during knee abduction. So in conclusion, our impactor is very successful at, at reproducing the clinical representative ACL injuries. We also have concomitant injuries occurring as expected. So we're extremely excited about this type of result. 
and it's very instrumental in identifying the patterns that are really unobservable, unobservable in vivo. And this is a potential validation tool for mechanisms, especially for risk factors. So moving forward in research, how we can better prevent these injuries from occurring in the first place. So the future directions, we're gonna do finite element analysis, which is computer modeling. It's that third leg of that instant approach. So now we can put different factors and variables that are hard to even do in vitro and apply them in a computer model and have the computer simulate again and again and again. And like Dr. Hewitt said, throw it all up on the wall and see where it converges because that will help us know what the truth is about this injury. Then also do real-time strain with a gome. This is uh, spray painted dots on clown paint and you can actually measure the strain that's occurring across this ligament. I'll let you see that one more time. So this is a project that's currently undergoing. And then also look at ACL reconstruction and see if there's any type of graft superiority or what may occur with graft augmentation in terms of outcomes. So with that, we'd like to acknowledge our funding, also our lab, all of the many people that make this possible. This truly is a, a team-based approach and a team that we appreciate because we all have our individual contributions and we make uh, a synergy that makes this work possible. So with that, uh, thank you very much and we'll take any questions you might have regarding that work. Good job, Nate. Yes. Um, I don't have an average age of the five that didn't tear. Um, best memory would uh, put them somewhere in the 40s. Okay. So Very equivalent. Yeah. Um, okay. The uh, the vast majority of our specimens. Um, were in their 40s for obvious reasons. The older you get, the more likely somebody is going to pass away. Um, uh, so I would say I would say about 60 percent of uh, of our specimens were between 40 and 50. So all we get is a report from the donations program that says whether or not the person was active and or active in their job. And uh, um, we won't take anyone who was sedentary or semi-sedentary uh, for greater than a month prior to uh, um, prior to passing away, including uh, chemotherapy as well. accuracy we can reproduce ACL tear. So imagine what you can do, whether, you know, for different types of reconstruction, augmentation. So we have companies coming to us. We have other investigators coming to us. And you can, 90% accuracy, tear an ACL just like it occurs out on the field on the court. It, it really is what, what these guys have been able to accomplish is pretty amazing. But more and more questions. Me a Somewhat of a random question with your end and the, the ligaments you were tearing, were they just one limb from the from the uh the physiologically, but just for upfront purposes, it was a good control to just have it equal across the board. We were going for best case scenario. Yeah. Ideal yeah. ratio. Yeah. Excellent question, and hopefully the NIH will think that's a good <laughs> question, too. <laughs> yeah, we, we are already planning out those experiments and submitted the proposal to the NIH, whether we have to get funding to do it. Just the legs alone are quite expensive, as you might guess. Yes. Dr. Bates, on your one graft, with the sensors in the knee, 
Yeah. I think for the ACL, you showed how you know, it would sense for you know, rupture and there would be no other feedback. I think for the ACL, though, each time it went down, it would kind of rebound, but not rebound back at where it was at the start. Is so, accurate or not? Um, part of the reason of that is the captures are, uh, are three seconds, and I'm not infinitesimally fast, unfortunately. Um, we're dropping that 70, uh, thanks, Deb. We're dropping that 75 plus pound weight on the specimen, and it's sitting there. So we've, they're rebounding, but that weight's now been added. The limb's now contorted um, into uh, whatever position it was contorted into based on the randomization of that trial. It's still bearing all that load until I take that weight off. And uh, then we'll also pick the ground up off of the foot and allow it to reset back to neutral. If I were to show you the, if you noticed uh, um, on those graphs, if you were to go back to them and see on the far left side, the initial point um, of each capture was actually right around um, uh, the same range. So it is getting back there. It's just I have to completely unload the limb before it's going to get back there. there. So next up, we have a couple of very special team members, Allison Mumblo and Aaron Hellum. So they're both physical therapists and they're both corks, which are clinical outcomes research coordinators. So we actually got Mayo Clinic to support us in that we have clinicians with dedicated research time to help us not only do the research, but also kind of get the research ethic ingrained within the clinic. So they, they, these, this crew of people is really important, and Aaron and, and uh, Allison are really important members of that team. So Allison, you're up. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, we're going to shift our focus a little bit to some clinical considerations, and we hope that this will be a good lead into some of the practical application pieces we'll get later on throughout the course um, in the breakout sessions. So we have uh, no disclosures. We have included slide numbers on each of our slides. If you have questions about a specific slide or would like additional references, our contact information will be at the end of the slideshow. ACL tears affect all types of athletes, and most of these athletes aspire to return to their same level of competitive sport, requiring months of rigorous rehabilitation. There will certainly be some commonalities amongst all of these athletes' rehabilitation. For example, initial post-operative treatment focus will be on minimizing effusion, restoring range of motion, and optimizing quadricep function. However, each of these athletes also possesses a unique set of sport-specific demands. And therefore, it's important that there are also some distinct differences throughout these athletes' rehab. An integrated treatment approach, approach will be able to accomplish all of these goals. 